No, I don't. There's two kinds of Mark. There's the Mark that wants. I'm live streaming? Okay. All right. Uh, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Uh, today, with God's grace, we're going to continue our series on the liturgy. And uh, we are going to talk about um, uh, liturgy and iconography. So uh, this is our last one in the first part. So this is session number eight. It's liturgy and iconography. Uh, and so we'll kind of briefly go through the icons uh, and talk about um, what they mean and, and, what they, and what the role is in the church. Um, there's a beautiful, uh, bye everybody, beautiful book um, called Icons, Windows into Eternity. So you want me to walk? Um, icons, windows into eternity, and, and sometimes I imagine that this is what icons are, is they're a window. Um, you take a, a, a plain wall, a white wall, and you put on it an icon, and, th and then it, uh, it creates a window into the wall of the reality of the situation, which is that, you know, God is present in our lives, and so it's, it's like this portal that comes through and um, uh, you know, allows us to see the reality of, of heaven that's on earth. So what is the icon? And I'll just very briefly uh, read this to you. It's the Orthodox Church's sacred art is known as iconography. The word icon is Greek for image, so it just means another image. Uh, so the word literally means writing with images, which is what iconography is. Um, and this icon is the uh, Orthodox's, Orthodoxy's highest artistic achievement. It is a gospel proclamation, a doctoral teaching, and a spiritual inspiration in colors and lines. So it is lots of things, and it is a sacred art in our church, and it's not something uh, that we take uh, for granted. Um, unfortunately, many churches, uh, if you go to Egypt, uh, you'll find that many churches that were built in the 18th century, um, there was a period of time in the 18th century when the government was favorable towards churches, and they allowed them to build churches. So what the church did is they built a bunch of churches, and they didn't have enough iconographers to write excuse me, all the icons in the church. So what they ended up doing was bringing in a lot of Westerners to write the icons. So unfortunately, many of the churches you'll find in Egypt have, do not have icons in them. They have Western uh, paintings in them that are different than the sacred art of the church. Um, so the, the traditional Orthodox icon is not a, a holy picture. Um, it is more, it's more than that. It is not a pictorial portrayal of some Christian saint or even a photo, in a photocopy way. It is, on the contrary, the expression of the eternal and divine reality of the given person or event depicted. Now, what does that mean? That means that um, the, the, the icon is more than even just telling a story. It's trying to tell you a theological reality. It's trying to tell you about who the saint was, how he or she saw Christ, how they interacted with God, what was spiritual and beautiful about them and that's what the icon is trying to bring more than this is what the saint looked like um, because the, you know at the end of the day I don't really care all that much what Saint Athanasius looked like uh, what his face was like what his facial features were like and whether or not I accurately de uh, um, uh, de 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 um, depict <laughs> uh, depict his his image um, uh, that's less important to me than to depict the, the theology of Saint Athanasius and his his power and his the and his spirituality and his his understanding of dogma. Um, interestingly, well, let's get this one. Oh, no, we'll go back to it. I'll I'll do it. So this is one of the oldest icons in the world. In fact, this is uh, to many the oldest icon of Christ that exists. It's in uh, the, the monastery of Saint Catherine in, in the Sinai Peninsula. And you can see Jesus' face kind of looks like he's split halfway down the middle. So one half of his face looks one way, and the other half of his face looks the other way. And when you take it and you cut it down the middle, and then you just flip it over like a graphic designer would, you can see that there's two different faces of Christ there. And many different interpretations exist, but you can see that on the, on the left-hand side of the, of the screen there, um, or the right-hand side of the screen, rather, is Christ the human, and then the other one where he's holding the book is Christ uh, the God. And so what this iconographer is trying to show is that God, is, that Jesus was both God and man. And so you put them all together uh, and you can see the very first one there is what it looks like. And then if you split, just split down the middle and superimpose, you find two different kinds of images. So everything in our church uh, tailors to the spiritual. 
um, to both the spirit and the body. So everything in the church is both. Um, rituals have spiritual meanings as well as physical. So we, we make the sign of the cross. Um, and we have, you know, um, uh, lots of things in the church that are uh, designed uh, for the body. For instance, example, we have incense for smell, we have icons for sight, we have chanting for our ears. So we, we do matanyas, we make the sign of the cross, we beat our chest. There are physical things that we do to bring in the body. So it isn't enough to have bare walls on a church and say, well, you know, we're just going to imagine that the saints are there. Why not allow my mind and my eyes to feast on the icons and let me see iconography and see the saints using my, 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 my sense of, of sight. So the, everything in the church uses both body uh, and spirit. It's not enough to just, uh, just have the spirit. And so iconography, though, is not a physical art. It's, it's meant to be a spiritual art. And so um, we're far less concerned with the anatomical correctness of an icon, right? We don't, we're not too worried about whether or not exactly we have the right proportions and whether or not the body looks the way the body should. In fact, we would rather tell a more symbolic meaning by making, for example, the eyes larger than they should be or the head larger than it should be. So it isn't about physical proportion. It isn't about depicting the human body as much as it is the spirit. So both are there. But if you have to give weight to one more versus the other, the weight will go to the spirit and not the physical. Um, and again, it's not about the, 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 the beautiful, the beautiful St. Mary, you know, with the blonde hair and the blue eyes and, you know, and the curvy body sometimes, um, or the, you know, the, the St. George who has lots of muscles and, you know, he's really buff and, and things like that. These are, these are very physical characteristics. And what the iconographer or the, or the painter in that case is trying to show is that St. George is really strong. And he wanted to depict his strength as muscles. And obviously, we don't really care if St. George had muscles, right? That, those are not the muscles that we're interested in, right? We're interested in his spiritual muscles, if you will. The fact that he was so spiritually disciplined that he could be tortured for seven years and not give in and not succumb and not deny his Christ. That's the St. George that I'm interested in, not you know, how big his biceps were. So it's meant to show the spiritual characteristic over the physical, right? Um, so I'll just go through some of the things here. It doesn't show St. Mary as physically attractive, you know, a beautiful woman that way. She's not beautiful because she's physically beautiful. She's beautiful because she's spiritually beautiful. And that's the way I want to show her. Um, we never show pain or agony in, the, in Christ or the martyr. So even, even when the martyrs are being martyred in the icon, we don't show pain. Um, the mouths are smaller. Oops, sorry, I missed one. The eyes are larger. You know, it's as if the, since the, the goal of our life is to be illumined, right, it's that these saints saw. They saw more than everyone else saw. And so their eyes are disproportionately large in their faces. Their mouths are, sm are, are, are smaller because tongues are dangerous. They don't, they don't even talk much. Their ears are enlarged because the saints hear our prayers. They're always peaceful. Uh, and they shouldn't be, you shouldn't really be able to recognize their faces so much. I mean, now it's a bit challenging with, you know, saints like Pope Krillos and Archdeacon Habib Gerges and, and even Amba Brahm, Bishop of Fayuma, we actually have pictures of them. So we try to do this hybrid mix of, well, we kind of want to show their faces, but not really. Um, but it isn't about that uh, specifically, because icons have transfigured faces, right? They, they have the image of Christ as their face. And that's why when you look at, for example, the Last Supper, you find in an icon many of the saints, all of all of the apostles, kind of look like Jesus. And you think, wow, you know, this iconographer isn't really good at drawing faces, right? He keeps drawing the same face over and over again. But aren't we all in the image and likeness of God? So isn't that the image that we want to have? Isn't that the face we want to have? Um, okay, and so this is a really nice quote from the book The Icon by Ma Michael Cano. He says, Whereas renowned Renaissance paints such as Raphael, painters such as Raphael da Vinci and others offer us in their religious subjects a beauty that is more physical than spiritual, where anatomical detail, perspective, and colors true to their surroundings are of the greatest importance. An iconographer, however, abandons every superfluous detail as to capture the realm of the immaterial, the spiritual, and the eternal. Both time and space are lost and have no meaning. Right? And we see this when we look at an icon of St. Anthony, this, this particular icon. Look at the face of St. Anthony here. Look at the beauty in his eyes. Look at the peacefulness. You know? And as we zoom in on his face, 
there's there, that's a face that has seen God. It's it's a face that's been disciplined, that loves, that cares, that has peace, that has joy. And so every time you look at this face and you look at those eyes, you just want to keep looking in His eyes, and and you wanna you wanna be in the presence of this saint, right? It's a it's a peace, it's a love, it's a joy, and it's very deep. You can tell the depth of His peacefulness, right? And I imagine if I sat with this man that I would feel peaceful and I would feel love looking into his eyes. And I, and I have to compare that with a picture like this, right? I don't even know what this is, right? This is a really buff angel who's got, you know, guns and a full head of hair and he's cleanly shaven and he's, his hair is even long and he's sitting there next to the girl holding. I mean, this is such a physical picture, and it's the contrast couldn't be further. This it's, it almost feels weird, you know. What is this artist trying to do? Who do you think God is? Who do you think an angel is? You know, why would you depict him like that, other than some you know almost lustful, you know, um, sensual way? Uh, it's very sensual. It's very attractive to you know uh, a woman because of his his you know. And and so this isn't what attracts us to God at all, right? And again, you compare the look in his eyes to something like this. And then we have like icons of the Theotokos, for example. Um, this icon, icons always have a gold background, which reminds us that they're in heaven. It's a gilded 24 karat gold. Uh, and the halo is an expression of light radiating from within the saint. So you notice the halo in an orthodox icon kind of goes out in a circle like this. It's as if light is emanating from them. They have acquired the spirit of God. They have united themselves with Christ. And from that unification, the light has gone inside them. And that light then emanates out of them. Right? And so this is a very important feature. Um, and the sign of holiness by attaining spiritual striving supported by the grace of God. And so this differs a little bit from some of the Augustinian views that, that, um, and some of the, the, the Calvin views of predestination, which basically say that if you're saint, if you're a saint, you're saint because of God's grace only, not just because of your own uh, um, work, but only God's grace. And, and in Orthodoxy, we believe there's a mix of both, right? I, I, I work towards my salvation. I work to empty myself and to die to myself, and then God does everything else. Um, and so, for example, when you go see a, a halo in, in, in some of the Western pictures, it looks like a dish that came down from heaven, that descended from heaven upon their heads, as if to say the holiness of the saint has come directly from heaven and not from anything they've done. And this is a little bit different from what Orthodox iconography shows. Uh, Christ always has a, a, halo, a cross in his halo. So every time you see any icon of Christ, you always find a cross in his halo one way or another. Um, there are three stars on St. Mary representing her perpetual virginity before, during, and after the Incarnation. And uh, what does St. Mary appear to be doing in this icon? If you look carefully, she's kind of pointing at Christ, right? And she's, you know, there's a, there's a distance there between her and him. He looks very old to be a baby. He looks like a 12-year-old boy who's a very small 12-year-old boy. He almost looks like a little mini-man, um, uh, but he's still a child. And she's pointing at him as if to say, this is the savior of the world. And she's presenting him to us. And ultimately, this is a very, you know, formal way to present Saint, uh, to present Christ. Uh, and and can com in contrast to an icon like this one. Right, now what is, what is this iconographer trying to say? Well, he wasn't saying what this, these iconographers were saying, this is Christ the divine, this is Christ God, this is Christ our savior. And then this iconographer is saying, this is, this is St. Mary and her, and her son. And, and then he, he was trying to emphasize the tender relationship between St. Mary and her son. This is the humanity of Christ, right? That she was his mom, right? And we see it again in this icon, right? This, this nurturing, he's got his hand around her, her neck, right? The, 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 the savior of the world, the son of the living God came and he held her neck and he kissed her. Right? And this is the, the beauty and the tenderness of our God, that he would come in such a form right, and, and dwell among us like that. Um, one thing that we always note is that Christ uh, always, uh, St. Mary is always to the right of Christ. And as the psalm says, the queen always sits to the right of the king. And that's why she always is at the right, even in an icon like this. Uh, and here we see her magnificence as she deals with the cross as his mother. Um, and uh, 
you know, in, in the Egbeya we say, I think in the ninth hour, my insides are ablaze when I behold your crucifixion. And that's, that's what this icon is portraying, right? This, this burning inside her when she sees her son killed uh, for, the, for, the, for the world. Um, and if you look at her face, it's beautiful, but not physically beautiful, right? There's a great quote. He says, how many sensually beautiful women, objects of passion and lust for their painters, lent their features to pose for painting of the mother of God? And so y you read about some of these other paintings of St. Mary, and you find that the guy was, you know, would sit there and he painted his girlfriend. And, you know, and sometimes she's scantily dressed, and, she's, and then he just writes at the bottom, this is St. Mary. You know, and then he sells it to the church or, or to whoever wants to buy it. And everyone's like, wow, she's beautiful. You know, and, it, and, so, and the, the story behind it is he's just painting his girlfriend because she's beautiful. And that's not the beauty that I want to see in St. Mary. That's not the beauty that I think St. Mary had. Um, it was an internal beauty. It was an internal beauty of peace and love and joy um, and humility and forbearance and the ability to withstand a tremendous amount of pressure to watch her son die and she never cracked. She never screamed out. She never cussed at the, at, the, at the Jewish priest. She never screamed at the Roman soldiers. She never said, that's my son. You leave him alone. You know, we don't read about her tearing at some soldier and saying, you get, rid of, you know, get off my son. And Nothing. She just she took it all quietly and peacefully. That's the beauty that we want to see in St. Mary. And so here the iconographer is trying to show this, this tenderness, this Christ's humanity. This was her son, and he died, right? And you see this loving relationship between them, right? How she's holding him after the crucifixion, uh, and it's killing her that, 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 that she, he had to die. And that was her son, and that, you know, at, at some level, God asked her to do that for him, right? And, of course, rewarded her greatly. Um, I'll skip that one. I'll skip that one. Um, so St. John, so the theology of the icon came into question because there's this group called the iconoclasts during the 7th century. They basically said that there should be no graven images, and so they started destroying every image of God, every image of saints. Um, and it's fa in fact, the Islam follows this exact same um, feature where there are no images allowed. Um, and you can see they went and they would go to something like this and just destroy it, and they would break at the faces, they would burn all the icons. So that's why there are no icons, for example, before the 7th century. All of them were burned uh, by the iconoclasts. Uh, and St. John of Damascus emerged as, as one of the saints who had to defend iconographer, and, and he said, I do not worship matter. I worship the creator of matter, who became matter for my sake, who willed to take his abode in matter, who worked out my salvation through matter. Never will I cease honoring the matter with which, with uh, which wrought my salvation. And so what he's basically saying is we don't, we don't think the paint and the wood is Jesus. Right? We don't think that, that, that the, the icon of Christ is Christ. Right? We don't think it's the Eucharist. Okay? And there were a few people in the early, early churches who got confused. Right? When, when an icon of Jesus, would, the paint would chip, they would take the little chips of paint and they didn't know what to do with them. They're like, well, this is so holy. It used to be an icon of Jesus. And now the, the paint fell off. So they take the paint, they put it in the blood, in the Eucharist, in the chalice, right? And this was obviously a very, you know, misguided. It was maybe a, a, a naive, noble thing, but it was misguided. And ultimately, this is the kind of thing that the iconoclasts hung on to and said, look, you guys are crazy. You know, and you're like, yeah, they kind of are, right? But that was just misguided. Those two are not the same. So when we, when we give offering incense to the icon, it's not like we think that is Jesus, right? We don't think that, of course, right? But we think this is the only thing I can see, right? This is what I can touch. Um, and I think of it sort of like, you know, when, when, when your grandmother passes away and you have a picture of your grandma, right? And, and you may even see someone who's a Protestant who doesn't believe in iconography or an atheist do something like this where they take a picture of the grandma and they kiss the picture. And you're, you're like, why'd you kiss the picture? You know, that's not your grandma. And they're like, yeah, I know. And they're like, well, do you worship photographic paper? And the answer is, of course I don't. So then why'd you kiss the picture? It's like, well, that, this is all I have. I can't see my grandma. Right? But I have this image of her. And it's natural for me to kiss the picture of grandma. Right? Even, even from someone who is an atheist or Protestant or, or, or someone who totally rejects all kinds of, of images. And this is where the veneration of iconography comes from. Um, 
So the, the icon of the nativity, we'll talk about this one and then we'll, we'll end. Christ became man. So God has become a man. And this is a big one. So Christ is in the center and is the main focus. Even St. Mary is off to the side. So if you look at the very dead center of the icon, it's Christ. This icon is about Christ. Mary is off to the side, and even further off to the side is, is, is um, St. Joseph. You can see he's even further aside. He's smaller, and he's even got his hand on his cheek like this, like, I don't even know what's going on. He's just confused. He's seeing angels. He's seeing shepherds. He's seeing wise men, and he has no idea what's happening. And this is kind of the proper role of, of it. Like, this is the incarnation of the Word of God. That's what this icon is about, right? Secondary, it's about Mary bringing Christ into the world. And it is certainly not about Joseph in any way, shape, or form. He's there, but he's just kind of there tangentially, right? He happens to be Mary's um, guide uh, and, and protector in the situation. And you can see in the, in the Byzantine icon, it's the same way. You know, there's a, they're in the dark cave, Christ is in the middle, and St. Mary, and you can see St. Joseph way off to the side in the corner, and he doesn't even know what's going on. He has his hand on his cheek. He's an old man. Now, you want to compare that to the holy couple. In this case, you have an icon of the uh, holy couple, and unfortunately, every once in a while, you'll see an icon, someone making an icon of the holy couple as well, kind of imitating the holy couple. This, this picture isn't about the birth of Christ. It's about two people who are married and having a child. And this differs in the Protestant view and the, ca and, the, and, the, and the Orthodox view. The Orthodox and the Catholics both believe that St. Mary remained a virgin after her birth and that her and Joseph didn't have marital relations um, and that she was uh, a virgin the rest of her life uh, and that she brought Christ into the world. And that was her, her role. And Protestants will, will believe that, no, that they, Mary and Joseph got married, they had more kids, and that Christ was just one of many kids that Mary and Joseph had. Um, and uh, this is something we reject, but this picture shows that other story, right? The story of this is a couple that got married and they had relations and, um, and continued having more, more kids, which just doesn't fit, right? That Jesus would be one of many kids, right? And this, this one happened to be the, the one that's the savior of the world, but the other kids, they're just kind of kids, you know, and they just kind of were normal, but this one was different. Okay, well, we'll end there. Um, thank you all very much. God bless you, and hopefully one of these days uh, we'll see you uh, not in quarantine, uh, and glory be to God forever. Amen. I'll go turn off the live stream.